Take your Bible, turn to Romans chapter number 1. Um, I'm going to have just a little short message here tonight. I don't want to preach long. And uh, uh, seriously, that's why we've had a long service. And I prayed this evening. And I thought, Lord, I sure don't have much to say tonight. Now I know why, because y'all had it to say. And that's good. That's good. I love it like that. It's been fine with me just to go right on with it. But I know uh, you come to hear the Word of God. And so let's look at Romans chapter 1. I want to show you one verse of Scripture and give you three little things here tonight out of it. Paul, the Apostle Paul, writing here in Romans chapter 1, he said this. Look at verse 14. 14, verse 14. He said these three things, and you see three words in there, three time, or two words in there three times. I am. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, that's verse 15, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Three times you see them little words. He said, I am. Look at verse 14. I am debtor. Look at verse 15. I am ready. Look at verse 16. I am not ashamed. That ought to be the testimony of everybody in here. Number one, I'm a debtor. Number two, I am ready. Number three, I am not ashamed. Amen? Old preacher laying, uh, said one night, they said, preacher, they said, we're going to give you 10 minutes to get ready to preach. He said, I stay ready. That's good. These three things a preacher ought to be able to do at the drop of a hat. Preach, pray, or drop dead. You ought to be able to do them three things at a second's notice. If you're living right, you can. Ed Maccabee said, if a man's called to preach, you ought to be able to go in his room in the middle of the night and wake him out of a dead sleep and slap him in the face with a wet rag and holler, preach, and he'll cut loose preaching. Amen? I don't know what he might say, but he'll cut loose the preaching. Now, I want to preach, just give you these three thoughts tonight. The three I am's. Three I am's. The greatest Christian in the New Testament and this side of the Lord Jesus Christ, no doubt, the Apostle Paul. What a man. What a ministry. How God used this man. Saved him on the road to Damascus. Blocked him down with that blinding light from heaven. One old seminary professor who didn't believe the Bible said, now old Paul, he just got out there in the sun and you know, he, got a, he had a sunstroke. And old fellow said, he had a sunstroke, all right. The son of God struck him down. And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest and turned him around and called him to preach. And Paul, the great apostle, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, wrote these words. Remember, what inspiration means, God took a hold of the head the heart and the hand of those men and penned the New Testament. A lot of ignorance about inspiration today. I, I, when I preached this morning, I preached this morning um, about uh, mockers. And if you were not here, I'd strongly urge you to get the CD back there if I can make you one on mockers in the last days. And they're saying the Bible couldn't be inspired because Paul said, uh, whether they're in the body or out of body, I know not. No, the Lord inspired him to say that. And when Paul said things like, um, I have no commandment, this is my own thoughts, God inspired him to write like that. So you got crazy people everywhere. It's looking for an excuse not to believe the Bible. But Paul said, I am three times. Number one, I am a debtor. He said to the Greeks, that was the educated people, to the barbarians, that was the heathen in the jungle, to the wise, to the unwise. He said, I owe everybody I meet a debt. Do you realize tonight that you are a debtor? You owe it to the people you work with to present Jesus Christ to them. You owe it to your family. You owe it to the kids you go to school with. You owe it. I am a debtor. I am a debtor. Uh, we're a debtor to the man that wears a $500 business suit uptown. We are a debtor to the person that lives in the, or under the bridge somewhere on drugs. 
We are a debtor. We are a debtor to the rich lady who thinks she don't need anything. We are a debtor uh, to the poor man on the street who's, who's an alcoholic or a drug. We are a debtor. We owe it to them. We owe it to them. That's why I preach on the bus ministry. That's why we have a bus ministry. You ought to thank God you go to a church that believes in the bus ministry. I know I harp on it and I put pressure on you and I know, I know sometimes it'll make you feel guilty and all that. You ought to thank God for that. You ought to thank God that we've got a church that cares about little kids. You know what a real church is? A real church is not just certain class of people. There are churches in every town where only a certain class of people go to that church. And you gotta be in a certain income bracket, drive a certain kind of car, you gotta be in a six-figure income and drive a you know, pretty nice car and everybody goes to that church that way and if somebody like uh, Lord, that we have around here, we're going out, they'd die. And, and, this, and you know what a church is? A real church is a man that's got a lot of money can sit right down beside a man, man driving a brand new Mercedes, can sit down beside a man who's got an old pickup out there. The only thing holding it together is bumper stickers. That's right, that's what a real church is. A real church is where a big rich lady with a diamond ring comes in and a little, little bus kid sits down and wipes a booger on it. That a real church church. That's what a real church is. A real church is people that the Lord cares about people. And Paul said I am a debtor. This world tonight is like a house on fire. Imagine it like a house on fire. And everybody in here has got one bucket of water. One bucket of water. We may not put the fire out, but we don't want to be caught with our bucket full when the Lord comes back. Listen, this thing may burn down, but when he comes back, I want my bucket to be empty, and I want to say, Lord, I throwed my bucket on there. And that's what we're like. We are a debtor. We are a debtor. We are a debtor. We are a debtor. You owe it to that person that works beside you to tell them the greatest story ever told. Now, secondly, number two, told you it's gonna be quick. He said, I am ready to preach. I am ready to preach. He said he took time. Paul went out there in the desert in the wilderness or wherever he went for two years and when he come back, brother, he was ready to preach. Now, I believe that everybody... Uh, you don't have to be called to the ministry to preach. Everybody should preach the gospel. Uh, all the boys and girls, every, all men, women, everybody should preach the gospel. And you ought to find out every way you can to be a witness and tell people uh, about the Lord. I heard about a man who found a gospel track. Actually, a man was in his house visiting. He had a fireplace and had a mantle up there and he had a big oyster shell and a piece of paper sticking in that oyster shell. And that man said, what's that? He said, it's a conversation piece. He said, well, what's conversation? He said, that right there is how I got saved. And he said, really? And he took that thing down, and it was an oyster shell and had a gospel track in it. And he said, for years, people tried to get me to go to church and get saved, and I wouldn't listen. He said, they tried to get me to live right, and I wouldn't listen. And he said, I, I, for a hobby, I went skin diving. I, I got down in the ocean. I like to see all them tropical fish, and I like to go scuba diving and deep sea diving and stuff like that. He said, I was swimming down there on the bottom of the ocean. I don't know how it happened, but he said there, and that oyster shell was a piece of paper. He said, I pulled it out, and the gospel of Jesus, somebody had put that track in there and dropped it in the bottom of the ocean and got that fella. That's the word of God right there. That's what the Bible can do. He said, I read that thing, got saved, and I am a testimony right now. Somebody put that track out. There's enough people right here tonight to put tracks out all over this country. Country, if we do it, I'm ready to preach. Be a witness. Be a witness. Be a witness. You say, "Well, somebody will get mad." That's good for you. Good for you. That's good for you. You ought to get cussed out once in a while. Uh, I don't like it, but it's good for you, ain't that right? Let me put it this way: get cussed out for doing the right thing. I had to qualify that there. I was one time, me and uh, uh, one of my deacons and Marion went visiting old Danny Tucker. Don't y'all know Danny? Me and Danny Tucker went visiting one time and somebody said, you need to go see these people up the lake. They said, now they're mean, preacher. They're mean. He said, these people's crazy. I said, well, we'll go. I'll take my fearless deacon, Danny Tucker, with me. Me and Brother Danny went over there. Everybody knows Danny Tucker. He's like, Ted, you know who Ted Nugent is, the old rock singer Ted? That's Danny Tucker. He got saved, and he got right with the Lord, and me and Danny went over there one night, and we was coming around the house, knocked on the front door, and nobody come to the door. 
And then we heard them. I said, I think they're in the back there. And I said, come on, brother. And I was walking around. I walked fast. And I, well, I was in front of him about four or five steps. And I come around. And there was a man stepped around beside the house and pulled a gun out, a rifle, and pointed it right. He pointed it right at me. And I just went, fell down. I got right there, flat. And there stood Danny. He said, you was going to let him shoot me. I said, well, I wasn't going to let him shoot me. I hit the ground, man. And, uh, he, and uh, you know, we, we, let, we have a witness to them people. I was, we was up in Virginia last year, and we was up there in Trammell. Y'all know the little town, Trammell? Pitiful. Pitiful little old town. There's about 30 houses, and 15 of them burnt down. They burned them down for the insurance money. And uh, we went down there, and there's a guy come across the street, coming at me. I thought, I thought he was coming after me. I really did. He came after me like this. I thought, oh, my goodness. Some of y'all have heard me tell that story about when we was in Marion years ago. I used to preach flea market every Saturday. Every Saturday. Clockwork. Don't you preachers ever say you ain't got no doors open. There's one. And we used to go there every Saturday and preach. And I got on top of a van. And I was preaching on top of a van like this. The Bible says repent. Just like I do in here. And there's this fella come up and put his foot on the bumper of that van. And he pulled out a knife that long. I'm not kidding. And I just sort of looked down like that. Oh, oh. oh the Bible says. I thought, well, maybe he brought him a knife and he's looking at it or something. He put his boot on the bumper of my van and start sharpening it like that. I went, uh-oh. I felt led to preach a little while. I wasn't gonna come down. I preached a little bit longer. And finally, I come down, had a ladder on the side of that van, come down like that, and there's a gang of preachers around and said, good, good job, brother, good job, brother, good job, brother. And I come to him and I stuck my hand out and he said, you better be glad you quit when you did. I said, okay. Have a nice day, buddy. And I'm telling you, that guy's going to kill him. And he got Gene Goose. Gene Goose was there the next Saturday. I don't know. I wasn't there that day. I didn't feel led to go back for a while. <laughs> I prayed about it, and the Lord said, don't go this week. Now, I, uh, but for some reason, I didn't go. And he got Brother Gene, had him in a headlock. That same guy. He's the one that chased me all over Nebo that night. You remember that, Carrie? He, I, I, don't know, you was, I don't know how old you was then. She was probably maybe 17 or 18, and that guy got in behind me. He's a crazy man, had bear welding on the side, bear, like a bear welding on the side of his truck, and he got behind me. He moved down here from Kentucky or somewhere. I don't know what happened to him. He's probably dead now, and, uh, and he started chasing me, and somebody called the house and said, Bear's chasing Brother Danny, and Jerry Carswell, he's an old rough guy from Nebo that got saved I went to school with. Jerry liked to shoot pool, and he grabbed a cue stick and put it in his car and took off after Bear. And there was me going up the road and Bear going up the road and Jerry going up the road and Jerry's going to knock his brains out with that cue stick and he would. He would, I'm telling you. Jerry liked to fight. He always liked to fight and he was going to hit that guy. And you know what? Uh, too many dangerous tolls and snares I have already come. It ain't been the first time that it won't be the last. But I'm telling you, I've been through enough to know that he'll take care of you if you'll stand for what's right. And if something does happen, he'll be with you. What a way to go, brother. What a way to go. Enjoy the Lord. I'm telling you tonight, we ought to be ready to preach the gospel. I'm glad to say in this dark old sin-cursed world that the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ is still what this world needs. It's still what people need. It's still what our kids need. It's still what our grandkids need. It's still real, and it's still right. A girl called me from Florida the other day and was giving a testimony about, uh, and, and some of y'all know her, and, and I told her, she said, those days when I come there, she said, it was so real. And I said, listen, what we had all them years is right. It's right, y'all. What we believe is right. We may be in the minority, but we're supposed to be. Right. How do you think Noah's family felt? Oh, yeah. Eight in the whole world. I'm ready to preach. You say, I can't preach. I heard this story about... Uh, uh, this guy, this missionary, he was over in China or somewhere, and uh, he was over there, and in China he had to preach through an interpreter. I'm telling you, I've done it, and I ain't too good at that. I preached in Germany, and when I preached in Germany, I had to preach through an interpreter. Oh, God. You know, you know how hard it is to interpret for somebody like me? I ain't, uh, the language we talk, only people know it's people live around here. Uh, uh, you, you, that's why you can't buy liver must nowhere but Western North Carolina, and you can't buy real liver must nowhere but Myron. 
The, re- the other kind ain't no good, ain't that right? Real liver must come from Marin, North Carolina. Uh, but anyway, uh, and people, I talked to somebody in New York yesterday, and she, this girl called, and I said, y'all have, you don't have liver mush? She said, no, but when they say it, they don't mean what we, what we mean. But real liver mush is good for the soul, brother. Uh, uh, it might not be for your body, but it's good for your soul. And I'm telling you something. Uh, I, I was uh, preaching in Germany, and you have to stop. The Bible says, you better get right with God. German. I said, good night, this is horrible. I, you know how hard it is to tell a long story with an interpreter? I, don't, I couldn't figure out how many words he could remember. I thought, well, how long do I talk before I stop and let you talk? So I'd seen him do it on TV, and I'd just say a couple sentences and let him talk, and I'd say a couple sentences and let him talk, and I'd, I'd preach in Haiti, and I preach, and this guy was in, in China. And he was preaching, and a missionary had to preach to an interpreter. And they had a missionary there, and he loved the Lord, and this guy got up, and he was dry, dead, liberal, backslid, un- pitiful, pitiful preaching. Just dry. And he says, and so we see that the gospel that the Lord loves everyone, and the Chinese going, uh, the guy's going, Yo, you know, is that Japanese? I can't tell the difference. I don't mean nothing bad by that. I don't know the difference. Jean Zélé, mais vous, that's uh, French. I took French in 11th grade. You believe that? I learned my name, Danielle, Danielle Chateau. Chateau's a castle. And my French teacher, I said, I'm getting out of this. This is crazy. And my French teacher, Miss Kelly, she said, Danny. You are so smart. You could learn this. And I said, Miss Kelly, why would I want to know French? Can you tell me that? She said, well, you never know. And I said, come on now. I, I got out of there and got PE2. I already had PE1, got PE2. <laughs> so I had two hours to play ball there in, in my senior year. And they stuck me in French class and I hated it. Uh, but anyway, uh, he said, he talked a little bit, Chinese interpreter. Talk a little bit, Chinese interpreter. Talk a little bit. Chinese interpreter. And that mystery said, boy, I'm glad when that guy gets through. That's pitiful. And he finally quit. And they gave an invitation. Them Chinese people start coming, crying, getting saved right and left. He went, good night. That's the sorriest preaching I've heard in my life. How did he, how come all these people got saved? He told the, he told the interpreter, he said, man, that's the worst preaching I've ever heard. He said, how did how those people get saved? He said, oh, me no tell him what he say. <laughs> uh, me tell him about Jesus. <laughs> smart guy right there, smart guy. And you know what? There's somebody that you can tell about Jesus. There's somebody you can tell. I'm a little bit sick of these people that want a deeper walk with the Lord and a deeper life and great truths nobody's ever heard but don't ever go out and witness it. You know what the real evidence of being filled with the Holy Ghost is? You'll get out of here and tell somebody what God's done for you. You shall be witnesses unto me after the Holy Ghost. Hey, you want to be full of the Holy Ghost? You know what the Holy Ghost will do? He'll put you out witnessing. He'll put you out witnessing. I mean, if you say, well, we'll have, we'll, have a, we'll have a Bible study and we're just going to learn. We don't, we don't even go to church. We just meet and have a Bible study and we just all say what we think. Yeah, you know, I know what your problem is. You don't want nobody preaching to you. You don't want nobody peeling that hide once in a while. You don't want nobody smacking you in line, telling you straight enough, get it right. Real Holy Ghost power will make you witness. Don't tell me you're full of the Holy Ghost and won't witness. It ain't true. Finally. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. I'll never forget the first time I preached on the street. I was literally terrified. There's some guys in Marion did it, and I heard a guy preach on the street one time, and I wanted to do it so bad I couldn't stand it, and I was chicken. You say, Brother Danny, you use chicken? Well, you try it. Try it. Go to Morgan in downtown next Friday night and try it. I mean, it... It's a lot more guts than football. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I, I'll never forget, me and these boys went to the Little Buck. Does anybody remember the Little Buck in Marion? Whew. We're getting old now, y'all. The boy remembers the Little Buck. He ain't but eight. Little Buck in Marion was where everybody used to go get foot-long hot dogs and really, really greasy fries. Y'all remember it, don't you, Sandy? Brother Max? Yeah. Well, I like to go to the Little Buck. And they, they would uh, they'd come out and wait on you. Y'all remember the little buck, don't you, Miss Millie? 
Um, they'd come out and wait on you. Them old times are gone now, except them girls would come out at Sonic on roller skates or whatever they do. But they'd, they'd come out and take your order, bring you out a foot-long hot dog and uh, French fries, and we went down there and ate a hot dog. And we were sitting there, and I couldn't even eat that hot dog thinking about preaching on the street. And I said, by the grace of God, next Saturday I'm going to do it. I said, I don't care if they do life at me. Man, I went up there the next Saturday, and I did, and I never got such a blessing in my life. There's something about sticking your neck out a little bit and taking a stand for the Lord. I'm talking about being smart, Alec. I'm not talking about being a judgmental, self-righteous, holier than that. I'm talking about standing up for Jesus. I'll tell you a story, and I, I quit. One time, there's a murder trial going on in Marion. We used to preach on the street all the time. This was when I was about 20, I guess I was 22, maybe 21. Maybe 20, I don't know. Somewhere right around in there. It was before we ever started New Manor. 19, maybe. And uh, 100 years ago, uh, they was having a murder trial in Marion. Then, hardly nowhere had air condition. First churches I preached in didn't have air condition. Preachers in church all the time don't have air conditioning. Now they call service off if the air conditioning tore up. That's how pitiful this generation is. And I went up to preach. And I felt like the Lord wanted me to go uptown and preach in Marion. I got right there in front of the courthouse lawn and I started preaching. And there was not one soul up and down the street. Here went a car, laughed at me. Here went another car, like, ooh. Who's that weirdo? What's wrong with him? Did he get out of Broughton or something? What, where'd he come from? And his life and stuff. And I was preaching, the Bible says if you don't get right with God, you're just like that. And about a week later, I was somewhere, and somebody said, Danny, what'd that cop say to you the other day? I said, what cop? That cop. I talked to you on, when you was preaching. I said, ain't no cop said nothing to me. I would got my Bible and left. And they said they was having that murder trial in the courthouse. Marion Courthouse got them big old windows. All them windows was raised up. It's truth, true story. And right in the middle of that thing, I was, and my voice was bouncing off them buildings, going right, they could hear everything I was saying in that courtroom. And he said, the judge stopped and said, somebody go down there and tell that guy to be quiet to where, to where we can have court. And a cop come down there after me, and I was done and gone. Got my car and left. That's the truth. <laughs> That's the truth. And you know what? I never have forgot that. I never have forgot that. If God puts it on your heart to do something, it may seem silly. You may think that's the dumbest thing. I, I, well, you read that Bible. Look at Gideon's 300. God told Gideon, he said, you got 10,000 men left, and everyone that laps water like a dog, you keep them and the rest of them send them home. And, and 9,700 got down and put their mouth in that water and went, sucked it up like a camel with a, like, a, like, a, like that. And 300 guys got water in their hands and lapped like a dog. And he said, there's your men right there. You know why he done that? Because the rest of them guys are just interested in filling their belly. These guys were watching for the enemy. They were keeping an eye out. And he said, there's your man. By them 300, I'll deliver the Midianites into thine hand. God don't have to have no big crap. Never has. One man in God is a majority. I am not ashamed. Don't be ashamed. Let's go out here tomorrow and witness. Let's stand. Let's stand tonight. Let's stand. We're not going to sing tonight. She'll play.